with us today is a awesome individual who happens to be, oh by the way, a five-time Paralympic medal winner, a four-time world champion, who is currently preparing to go back to the games in Sochi, Russia, who is a sought-after motivational speaker by corporate America, and guess what? Her name is Stephanie Victor, and she's here today to be with us. She's also a friend. Uh, so, Stephanie. <laughs> I prefer downhill, you know that. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Okay. Jill is a smart lady, I can attest to that. And a friend. Lights, camera, access! Yeah, that's the theme. And that is my life story. Yes, I love it. What does access provide? Access provides us opportunity. And what I'm going to share with you today is that without opportunity, greatness is missed. So we don't want to miss greatness in our lives by shutting down opportunities. Your life can change in an instant. Mine did. I was simply going out to dinner. Standing in the driveway with my ex-boyfriend, right there, that ought to tell you. <laughs> he had nothing to do with it. An out-of-control car came up into the driveway and crushed me in between the two vehicles. Pinned at my legs, I was dragged 30 feet down the street, and when the cars came to a stop and I fell to the pavement, the soccer player in me, who felt knocked down, what do you do when you're knocked down? Get you get back up. You get in the game. When I saw the orientation of my legs, the massive crush injury I had sustained bilaterally above and below the knee, I realized I wasn't going to just hop right back into the game. Eight hours later, in an emergent effort to save my life, after arresting on the operating table, the doctors made the difficult choice to amputate both of my legs. When I woke up in ICU, and yes, I woke up right away, because see, this gal here is stubborn. Laying on the pavement there, I made a declaration to the universe. I did not think about, am I going to lose my legs and my spinal cord injury? What's going to happen here? All I thought about is, uh, am I going to live or die? And I didn't want to die. So I put a prayer out to the universe, and I asked God for my life. And when I woke up in ICU, that prayer had been answered. Now, had I known that God answers prayers like that, I would have gotten more specific. <laughs> Learn the lesson, people, here. When you put it out there, dream big. Go for exactly what you want. And you'll see later in my story how I corrected that. Three years in and out of the hospital, 14 reconstructive surgeries. A massive effort on my part to walk again. You see, my background was that I was an actress. I went to USC film school. I'd spent five years running around this town with a camera in my hand. And I was really moved by documentary films and by people and truth and the truth in storytelling. And as I lay there in ICU, I realized that what was unfolding as a result of this tragic circumstance was probably going to be a pretty great film if I chose to make it that way. I had a dream in ICU that I made a documentary film about my recovery. And when I woke up, I shared this 
vision with my family. And they're kind of like, you want to make a movie? Well, let's just get you off of life support, and then we'll go from there. The camera was what I knew. The camera grounded me in my life before my accident. So imagine, here's the set, lights, camera, access. The set is the ICU. And the big important doctor, no offense guys, there's more to life than the textbook. What we talk about in the beginning, missing opportunities. When you don't come into a hospital room and see the person laying there in the bed for who they are, you miss an opportunity in how to treat them. Because see, I had it in my mind that I would walk again. And when the doctors came in and said, ah, you, got some, you suffered a massive crush, bilateral amputation, um, you're disabled, you are an amputee, and in our experience, you will never walk again. It was everything I could do. You, you see, I'm from Swickley, Pennsylvania, so I'm a bit conservative. <laughs> Thanks for that shout out. They got some Steeler fans out there. Well, I was raised with manners, and I didn't want to laugh right out loud in his face, but him standing there with two legs, I found it kind of funny that he wanted to tell me whether or not I would be able to walk again. I put the camera in his face. Oh, people change. Why do you change when, they, when you're up in front of an audience or the camera's on you? Why do you change? You're on the spot. People see you. You're accountable. So my camera became my lifeline because it connected to me. It connected me to who I was before losing my legs. And it also empowered me to enroll the people who were giving me these diagnoses, to be present, to treat me as a human being. Because I'll tell you what wasn't amputated with my legs. My dreams, my goals, my understanding of who I am as a person. You can't cut that off. But you can get disconnected from it because the story around the appearance of disability distracts people from being present with what's really going on. What was going on was, there was a tough gal from Pittsburgh there who's a hell of a fighter. And we better figure out, are, are some miracles going to happen here? She believes. So why not? Three years I walked with those bilateral above knee prostheses, with the forearm crutches. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> it is nothing like the human leg. That's a pretty clever design. And what I discovered was spending an hour to put the prosthesis on, to be upright, to subconsciously fear for my life, am I going to fall, am I going to be humiliated, is my leg going to fall off? Because with above knee prosthesis, you can lose suction, it falls off, it's not pretty. But on top of that, I, I was bleeding out my suture line. Like, this was critical. And what was so ironic was that when I was standing, even on these carbon graphite titanium legs, I was looking at people in the eyes. And they treated me differently. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I'm going to show up bigger and more of who I am and not let this external circumstance define me because the prosthesis aren't working. They are making me disabled. Yeah, I could get my heart rate up to 187 and go from here to that door on this, sorry, Carpet, I was going to use an adjective there, and I decided not to. <laughs> I can race from here to that door and probably beat most of you in the room. 
So then I, I really became clear about who I am. And this whole thing, you know what? It's, it's everywhere. It's not just disability. You turn on your TV, right? How long does it take before the first commercial comes up that you find out all that's wrong with you? Your hair loss, your white teeth, your, or dirty teeth, or what, whatever your problem is, commercials and the media will tell you right away what is wrong with you. And you can live your life running after that fantasy and trying to fulfill that with, gosh, we have all kinds of crazy means to, to fulfill that idea of perfection and beauty which is out there external. Or, you can embrace who you are and recognize the beautiful, extraordinary uniqueness that is the creation of each individual person in this room and on this planet. There's only one of you. There will o okay, there's some twins. <laughs> but even in that, you are unique, made in the image and likeness of God. And that is not something that needs to be improved upon. It needs to be expressed fully. What I learned was I could cower. I could make myself crazy trying to walk. I could make myself small by being disabled. Or I could get out there and live life fully. And I felt that that was the best way to say thank you for a second chance of life. Guess where I found it? Skiing! You guys obviously don't ski. You're in Southern California. You don't have snow on your mind. I just came from Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> Skiing is where it's at. That's where I found it. Here's where I corrected my mistake about declarations to the universe. I called up the National Ability Center in Park City, Utah, and I said, I'm interested in taking uh, an adaptive ski lesson. Can you put me with a cute instructor? <laughs> Ask the universe, you just might get it. Oh, did I get it. Marcel. Sounds French, doesn't it? That's what I thought. I tried to impress him with that. That didn't work. He slammed his fist on the table and he said, I thought you came here for a great ski lesson. I'm Swiss. Only Swiss people know how to ski. <laughs> yes, sir. We're off to a great start. He gave me a form to assess my physical ability. Now, I'll have you know that after my accident, I didn't stop participating in sport. In fact, that's how I met Andy Houghton over there, longtime friend. Sport gave me an opportunity to get back in the game. And I got news for you. If I put you all in a wheelchair right now and on a basketball court or in a sled to play sled hockey or in my monoski to go skiing, I would make you disabled by using the equipment, but you would find a way to be competitive. It is our nature. We want to win. Does anyone wake up wanting to be a loser? No. Sport was a critical part of my recovery. And wheelchair sport, through programs like what Andy was the director of, provided me opportunities. So here I am in Park City, Utah. I haven't tried skiing. But I've tried wheelchair basketball, bad for the nails. <laughs> Swimming, kayaking, tennis, track and field, I didn't like that, and I'll tell you why. I was a runner before my accident, and I would run five to eight miles every day. They put me in that chair, bent over and said, push, and do this for the rest of eternity, and I was like, I don't know, I'm just spending all my time thinking about how I wish I had legs back because it was more fun to run. Skiing was a completely different opportunity. And when Marcel gave me that form and it said, assess your athletic ability, well, I, I didn't even read much further than that. I gave myself a perfect score on everything. 
You do the same thing too when you come back into the country and you gotta fill out those customs forms. You just, no, 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 no. Well, I gave myself a yes, 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 yes. And at the bottom it said, what are your goals in skiing? Uh, to, to, to not break my face? I, you know, I just got here. What are goals do I have in skiing? But I'm kind of, I guess you've figured this out by now, a, a, a player, someone who likes to have fun. And I wrote on there to win a gold medal. Huh, that sounds cute, Mr. Marcel. <laughs> oh, that was a mistake. He grabbed that form from me and he said, oh, so you think you're in pretty good shape? We're gonna find out. You think you're gonna win a gold medal? Anybody can win a gold medal. You just sign up for whatever easy bingo match or NASTAR race course, you can win a gold medal. If you are going to set a goal, make it something worth your while, something real, something that you have to reach for, something that will challenge you to activate levels and dimensions of yourself that you don't even know is possible. Without even thinking, I changed it to a Paralympic gold medal. Now, <laughs> I had no business making that kind of a declaration like that on that day. I had no idea what it would take to commit to winning a gold medal. But two things were going on. The Salt Lake Games were going to be in my home country in three years, and with Marcel, I thought if I train really hard, maybe I'll get the glory of being a member of Team USA competing on home soil for a Paralympic gold medal. And let's say I do it, can you think of a better ending for my movie? <laughs> Dreams don't die, people, and they don't get amputated either. So I said yes. Yes, I want to win a gold medal in the Paralympics, and we need to start training. We're wasting time. Let's get out there. The first thing he did was he told me to push up to the chairlift. Now, in a monoski, do you guys know what that looks like? It's a seat with a frame and a motorcycle shock that locks into a regular binding on one alpine ski. You have outriggers that look something like a forearm crutch, but there's a ski on the end. And with these outriggers, the ski in an up position, which allows you to push, I started pushing up the hill. That was hard work. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was gonna do it, and I was thinking, I've already blown it with guessing what country he's from. <laughs> I better like bleed out my eyes and push up to the chairlift. And then he said, okay, stop. Actually, the chair, there's another chairlift down the hill, and I don't do cross country, so we're gonna ski down to that chair. I just wanted to, I'm gonna periodically test your athletic, athleticism. Great. So with whatever I could absorb from him on that chairlift ride, looking over the edge and thinking to myself, what have I declared? What risks am I willing to take? How committed am I to this great ending for my film? We get off the chairlift and he says, okay, let's do it, let's go. And I take off. Momentum and G-forces will only help you for so long. <laughs> Without a foundation, I had not one. And I crashed something comical. <laughs> a yard sale, we call it. But here's what happened. When the ski came to a stop and everything was off of me, the hat, the goggles, the outriggers, the gloves, I undid the straps and I hopped onto the ground because I went to pick up the ski and get back up in it. And Marcel looked at me and he said, what are you doing? I told him, I forgot. I forgot in this moment that I didn't have legs. Anything that could allow me to forget, I want to do. The wheelchair was at the bottom, the struggle to use or not to use prosthetic devices forgotten, and I was free. This opportunity of skiing with an adaptive coach allowed me to be on the mountain, outside, in nature, and free. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it, but be sure to ask for a 
Have I taught you nothing? A cute ski instructor. <laughs> you have to remember the important things after my presentation. We pursued that goal of Olympic gold. I didn't win it the first time in Salt Lake, although it was a very memorable honor to serve on Team USA in my home country, especially six months in the wake of 9-11. You get to evaluate sportsmanship and camaraderie and your own country's values in a way that the pressure of an event that only happens every four years can put upon you. I won the bronze medal in Salt Lake, which was a pretty great, thank you. <laughs> For this rookie, that was a great accomplishment. But it wasn't the, the G. It wasn't the gold. And I didn't have an ending. So we went another four years. I won that gold in Torino, and also in my last games, Vancouver, where I won the first ever Super Combined. Thank you. A critical part of this journey has been using my skills that I learned as an actor, as a motivational speaker. I work primarily for the Hartford Insurance Group, who is the founding sponsor of US Paralympics, and we do all kinds of immersion events around the country. But the crux of what we do is to educate people who work for the Hartford that persons with disabilities fundamentally want to lead independent and productive lives. When you become disabled, it is not an end. It's not that you don't want to return to work or sport or play. It actually becomes a life-saving device to return to sport, work, or play. And when someone has that much at stake, you better believe they're going to show up. That's an opportunity that you don't want to miss. What's the largest sporting event in the world? Anyone? Take a guess. That's close. It's the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games happen every four years, alternating with summer and winter. What's the second largest sporting event in the world? The Paralympics. You're right. This is elite sport. The Paralympic movement has grown exponentially. Just in the last 12 years, I've had the good fortune of, of competing on Team USA. And what I have seen change in the last decade, our first games in Salt Lake, it was announced that the Paralympic team would stay in the same village as the Olympic team. That's a big deal, before it was separate. Somebody back there had some fiscal <laughs> sense to say, why are we separating this? Why are we reinventing the wheel twice? But it was a big deal as a Paralympic athlete to share the same village as the Olympic team. Does anyone know what Paralympic means? Does it mean paralyzed? Does it have anything to do with paralyzed? No, it actually means parallel to. Gets a little confusing because we associate para, paralyzed. Parallel to the Olympic Games. The Paralympics follow the Olympic Games every two, year, or every two weeks, uh, two weeks after the Olympics. Now, I think this is actually genius because what we joke about in my circles is how Aren't we fortunate that we have the Olympics as a trial run, a dress rehearsal before the real show gets there? <laughs> and we are giving a show, let me tell you. It's now starting to be recognized that as, inter why, why do we watch the Olympic Games? Why do we care? Is it so much that we love curling or speed skating? You get in involved in the people, the athletes, their story. There is not one single Paralympic athlete that doesn't have an extraordinary story of overcoming their own personal challenges to discover and live their values and live who they are in pursuit of excellence through sport. My mission with the Hartford has been to share on a grassroots level 
how valuable this resource of persons with different abilities can be. The latest consensus says that out of 300 million Americans, 60 million of them are persons with disabilities. Do you really want to give up a fifth of the marketplace, especially when they want to get back in the game? That's the people you can, that you can coach, right, Marcel? I'm coachable. <laughs> you can coach that person to get back into the game in your workplace, and they're going to bring an energy and a vitality that I dare say you won't find anywhere else, because something is at stake. It is so important that we take the risk. It's all, it only happens when you take the risk. You cannot win a downhill race unless you're willing to risk crashing. And that could be a career ender. But the glory of crossing the finish line and seeing your name up there on the leaderboard in first place and getting to hear the national anthem on the podium as the American flag raises and know that you did it, this is unlike anything else. So we must provide opportunities in the workplace in the same way that the Paralympic movement is now providing extraordinary opportunities for athletes in the US to compete in the second largest sporting event in the world. What will be the outcome? Well, my belief is when anybody discovers different levels, the potential of who they really are, greatness can be achieved. But if you're living out there, if you're living your life trying to please and affect the people around you, it will not happen. You cannot let anyone just make you less than who you are. Sometimes you have to take a stand and live your values and embrace who you are and put that forward. In doing so, you will take risks, and out of that risk and commitment to your goal and declaration to the universe, greatness can be achieved. Why else are we here? I had a near-death experience you don't need to come to that last breath in your body to get how great this life can be. And here's the good news. You have everything it takes right now in your mind, body, spirit being to make that happen. It's simply a function of your own choice. And through that choice, you will expand your awareness. Once that awareness is expanded, you must take action. And look out, greatness will follow. I don't want you to leave here after the last three days of being immersed and go home and on the plane ride suddenly have amnesia and forget about what happened here. You have a responsibility from having attended to go share with your coworkers with anyone that you feel appropriate to strike up the conversation about what you learned here. And through the dialogue and through sharing, you will start to activate your own creativity, your own ideas of how this movement can serve you. It is a movement. It is happening. Get on board with the energetic vibration of making a difference to provide access for all. You don't know the person who you gave that ramp to may be the one who's capable of saving your life or providing you the relationship that will make a difference in your happiness or providing you the creative impetus for you to discover all of who you are. It is a great pleasure to work with Jill Houghton and Andy Houghton and the United States Business Leaders Network. This is an incredible mission. I, I, I'm deeply moved by this because, you know, I see a lot traveling and we have to make accommodations as we go around the world for things that aren't always perfectly in place. For example, I was just last week at my sponsors. Uh, I'm sponsored by HBO and Scripps Network. Scripps Network uh, hosts the Food Network. Anybody like food? <laughs> of course you do. You know you watch the shows. So we were at Scripps 
and I was about to go on stage and present to their senior executives. And I was in one of those lifts. It's, it's not an elevator, it's made by Concord, and, it, it, and it's, it's a lift. Um, <laughs> well, I've never used one that has ever worked, and they're very loud. In fact, it sounds like a helicopter taking off. And I was in this lift, and the helicopter was buzzing, and it wasn't, it was just me in the lift. And it stopped. And I said, oh, oh my gosh, I have had to crap, scratch and crawl my way out of a lot of miserable situations, but not up another flight to get to my presentation. And I was, I was mic'd at the time, so I was like, help me. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. I'm in the Concord. <laughs> my husband and his, did I tell you that? I forgot to tell you that. Sorry, Marcel. I married my coach. <laughs> Talk about an opportunity. That's why I won the gold medal, you know that. It was the only thing that was different between Salt Lake and Torino. Uh, <laughs> so my husband comes to the lift and he opens the door and he looks down at me and he's like, um, okay. And you know, he's, he's, he fiddles with things. He builds things. So he started rattling and shaking and twisting and turning things off and putting things in circuitry and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh great, time's a wasting. Like before you have a rebuild this thing, get me up there. He got it to work. Thank you, Marcel. And I got to my presentation on time. But the young woman who uses an electric wheelchair who had come there to hear me speak didn't. And I thought, you know what, there is something really fundamentally wrong with this. Because this company, I see them everywhere, everywhere. I don't even know who they are. Who are these people? They make this device that hasn't really been tested, tried, and true on persons who are using it and supposed to benefit from it and they break down all the time. Every single owner of that type of lift that I've talked to has said, well, I don't know if it's working today. <laughs> Could you get away with that in your job? I couldn't get away with that in ski racing. Well, I don't know if I'm gonna be the fastest or not. <laughs> we have to dismantle and break down, have the courage, to break down that which is not working, get it out of the way, and move forward with innovative ideas and solutions. And, and, and this is what Marcel and I talk about. Like, this is not gonna happen if you don't consult the person who's using it. So what great news is this? You can hire a certified company that has persons with disabilities there, in the forefront, bringing their experience. Right? I'm no expert on building lifts, but I have become an expert on getting around. And I'll tell you what doesn't work. I come into a hotel room. This happens all the time. And I check in, and there's always such a nice girl at the front desk that I know I'm gonna have to yell at later. <laughs> Would you like an accessible room, Miss Victor? I'm shaking. That all depends. <laughs> what was your contractor's idea of an accessible room when they rebuilt this place? Are there two steps to get in the door? That has happened to me, I kid you not. Well, there's just a couple of steps. Here's my chair, show me how it has to be done. I go into the room and I kid you not, it's a nice room. I took the accessible room. I took a chance, took a chance. And I go in the room, and it's a nice room, a beautiful room, but I have to do one thing before I put my bag down. I have to check the bathroom. And I open the door, and it happens to be a room about the size of this one, <laughs> which to me seemed a little bit overkill for my wheelchair, because it's only a 23-inch turning radius. See, that didn't take up much. The sink is here. The toilet is way over there by the blue screen. There's a lot of bars around it, but behind, whoever gets on the toilet like this? <laughs> get on the toilet like this. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> the bathtub is over. 
Yeah, the bathtub was somewhere over there. <gasps> I think it has a bench. Is that a shower bench? Oh, cool, yay, there's a bench. I don't have to call down. And I flap the bench down, and it's hanging off, and I know this is going to be a problem. Noah, we have a flood. So I got to transfer over to this bench, and then I'm here, and then the shower head, well, first of all, it's on the ceiling. It's always on the ceiling. They are the tallest cleaning people in the world. <laughs> because it's higher than the, the regular rooms. I'm better off in a regular room. So it's up there, and I have to, how am I going to Spider-Man up the wall and get the shower head and Spider-Man back down and jump across the divide onto the bench and flood the entire floor and go back onto the toilet and hold onto the bars. <laughs> but wait, I know this is crazy. I want to put on some lotion. Here's the sink. It's either up here, which is great because I can drive under it. I mean, I can drive completely under it. Or it's down here, and, and it's like, oh, I, I can dive into that sink. That is low. That is really, we nailed the access here, guys. But I have my toiletry bag, and I go to put it on the, there's no counter. There's no nothing. We were so committed to making a sink floating somewhere between here and here that we forgot to put anywhere to put your toiletries. And, and every time this happens, I usually swear. I get upset. I'm frustrated. I have to move all the furniture around and bring the couch into the room. There's plenty of room. So I can bring the couch, the desk, everything into the bathroom so that I have somewhere to put my toiletries. And then I'm ready to get ready. And I, and I need some kind of basin underneath the, the flooding. Um, and I ask myself, in all seriousness, like, with the ADA and, and with people of consciousness in business, how is this happening? Because the hotels are always happy to tell me that we just remodeled, we just made our rooms accessible. And I'm like, why didn't you call me? I would have done it for free. I see such an incredible mission with USBLN. And for all the businesses, and it's, it's going to take off like wildfire, I just feel it. Forty right now are certified. These are the people you want to be doing business with. They are committed, they are taking action, and taking risks. But they also are the creative innovators that have the insight from living it and knowing it on how best to serve the community. Best part is, they care. They wouldn't be doing business as a person with a disability if they didn't want to give back. Everyone, disability or not, wants to lead an independent and productive life. We can do this in our workplace. Hire persons who are certified through the USBLN, and I promise you, they will make a difference in your business. Thank you for having me today.